Top Cats Rebel Connection. Cats Rebel Connection coming to you today with a topic that I know will be interesting to those who can at least sit through the first five minutes. And if you can sit through the first five minutes, then I know that you are a person that uh, that is like us, who is very much interested in the election process that uh, decides on our president and our vice president. However, uh, you'll also realize during the first five minutes that uh, the elections as we know them aren't actually what we mostly think it to be. In other words, the American presidential elections are actually not what it seems in the fact that the U.S. citizens vote, you know, like when we go to the polls and cast our vote and all that type of stuff. The U.S. citizens vote is not what decides on the president according to our Constitution. And this important legislation has been in effect for at least two centuries Yes, two centuries, since the 1700s, 1787, I believe. This legislation is actually in the Constitution. And just with that in mind, that should let you know that, uh, well, it's the Electoral College that actually decides who the president's going to be and who the vice president is going to be the electoral college. The electoral college, by the way, is a process and not a place. You see, the founding fathers established it in uh, the Constitution as a compromise uh, between election of the president by a vote in Congress and election of the president by a popular vote of well, what they call qualified citizens. And just for a footnote, for those of you who like to have reference points for research and just for common knowledge, that bit of uh, information comes from archives.gov. And uh, I guess I should say triple W before that dot archives dot gov. But there's a lot of more that I have to uh, share with you in reference to this whole. Well, to me, revelation. And I say revelation because I know as an American citizen myself in my late 40s, 
I'm well aware of how many people from teenagers all the way up until 85 years old and probably even older who have no idea whatsoever about our electoral process and how it actually runs. And I think most of this is contributed to or can be blamed on what most of us learned while we were while we were in school. As the old slogan goes, I myself <laughs> remember learning about this information when I was in junior high school. When I was in the eighth grade. For sure. But the more I think of it, it actually could have been a lesson that was also taught in the seventh grade. So at this point in my life, it has been many decades that I have been aware of this. And whenever you, I try to tell someone or if you're like me, whenever you've probably tried to tell someone, they simply do not believe it, although they go to the same schools that most of us do, which are public schools. Schools that are, not, that are not private. I understand in private schools, many students get different lessons. In comparison to public schools, the lessons in private schools are far more in-depth and students get a lot more time to learn about complicated processes, much like what today's topic is, which is the Electoral College, they have much more time to understand and to be able to uh, remember after they're tested on the information. They're able to remember exactly what the lesson was. Here in 2016, we have this extravaganza, many would say, having to do with uh, the current presidential members and candidates, Hillary Rodham Clinton and Donald Trump. And when I sit back and I watch the news and I read different articles and I think about all the stuff that's going on, and looking at all of this, <laughs> this, these theatrics that seem to be involved in the whole process and so many people that are just overwhelmed or totally uh, involved to a degree of mindlessness, I would say. It just makes me shake my head and think, well, what in the world are you doing? Because, you know, in all reality, if we never decided on one president, if none of us went to the polls to vote for the president, you can rest assured that there will be a president. There would be a president undoubtedly. Because, again, the Electoral College, which is in Washington, D.C., the administration is in Washington, D.C. The Electoral College will most definitely decide on the next president and the next vice president. In the info box underneath the upload here will be a link that you can go and check out that is so in depth. In depth. It's so in depth that it's just totally amazing. with an addendum of 136 references. So be sure to, to uh, look for those links that are in the info box, in the description box, and uh, you can get a much better picture in this constitutional legislation. The United States Electoral College is 
the institution that elects the president and vice president of the United States every four years. Citizens of the United States do not directly elect the president or the vice president. Instead, these voters directly elect designated intermediaries called electors who almost always have pledged to vote for particular presidential and vice presidential candidates and who are themselves selected according to the particular laws of each state. Electors are apportioned to each of the 50 states as well as to the District of Columbia, also known, of course, as Washington, D.C., The number of electors in each state is equal to the number of members of Congress to which the state is entitled. While the 23rd Amendment grants the District of Columbia the same number of electors as the least populous state, currently three, Therefore, there are currently 538 electors corresponding to the 435 representatives and 100 senators, plus the three additional electors from the District of Columbia. The Constitution bars any federal official elected or appointed from being an elector. That is just the basics and (laughs) I know for many people you may feel like wow I don't really believe this guy and I would say wow with the website that is actually devoted to the electoral college I would tell you to go and spend some time there because it's very important that we start realizing actually how the process works. The website is again, www.archives.gov. But here I have a sound bite for you that I'd like for you to check out and uh, it condenses everything quickly, but I will return After that, in a little vibe session, and uh, just fill in a little bit of the potholes in the lawn. So check this out. Pursuant to the Constitution and laws of the United States, the Senate and the House of Representatives are meeting in joint session to verify their certificates and count the votes of the electors of the several states for president and vice president of the United States. In 1950, the decision was made to give the Electoral College responsibility to the National Archives and Records Administration to be administered by the Office of the Federal Register. So this is a meeting of the presidential electors as they officially cast Maryland's electoral votes for president and vice president. When Americans vote at the general election, we're actually voting for a slate of electors. We're not voting for the candidates. Generally, there are people who are very active in their political parties within their states. But usually on the state's ballot, those slates of electors are represented by the candidates. Each state gets one elector per member of Congress. So, for example, Maryland has two senators and eight members of the House. So it gets ten total electoral votes. It's a winner-take-all system. Hi, that's for Barack Obama for president. Barack Obama for president. In each state, all the electors vote for the candidate who won the popular vote in that state. After the electors meet and they vote, they'll send a package to us. That package will contain a certificate of ascertainment and the state certificate of vote. The certificate of ascertainment just lists the number of votes each electoral slate got and tells you who won. The certificate of vote tells us how each elector voted. We review them to make sure that they have a seal, that they're signed, The Constitution says that people who are in Congress can't be electors. Sometimes we notice that they've listed somebody who's a member of the House or a member of the Senate, and then we contact the state and tell them that that person cannot be an elector. Today is the day before Congress counts the votes. A couple of the states actually had the wrong date for the inauguration, and so we asked them for amended certificates of vote. 
We just received our amended certificate of vote. What we'll do is just review it quick, and then as soon as we're done here, I will take it up to Congress. The next step is to scan the documents, and then we send it forward to our web programmer, who would then post it on our website so the public can actually view the document. There are no federal requirements on what certificates look like. This is this year's Ohio certificate. It's still the biggest. It's just a little smaller than 2008. The certificate of electoral vote in the state of Ohio seems to be regular in form and authentic. <laughs> <laughs> House will be in order. The certificates are brought down the aisle in ceremonial boxes and presented to the tellers who are going to open the boxes and count the vote. For someone to be elected president of the United States, they need to receive 270 electoral votes, which is half of the total plus one. After the 2000 election, Vice President Al Gore, in his capacity as president of the Senate, had to make the announcement to a joint session of Congress that he had lost the Electoral College. George W. Bush of the state of Texas has received for President of the United States 271 votes. Al Gore of the state of Tennessee has received 266 votes. The Office of the Federal Register maintains the certificates of ascertainment and the certificates of vote for one year after the election. We make them available to the public for review and inspection after one year's time they are transferred to the National Archives as permanent records. Street Lights by Ryan Little. Here on the Top Cats Rebel Connection. And uh, we're touching base today with the 
some very important information, especially uh, during this season of the presidential conventions and all of the news and everything having to do with the new president coming into office. We thought it was really necessary to uh, do a show that updates people who somewhat remembers and to inform those who don't know anything about it at all that each candidate running for president in your state they have his or her own group of electors the electors are generally chosen by the candidate's political party but state laws vary on how the electors are selected and what the responsibilities are the presidential election is held every four years on the Tuesday after the first Monday in November. We help choose our state electors when we vote for president, because when you vote for the candidate, we are actually voting for our candidates electors. Most states have a winner take all system that awards all electors to the winning presidential candidate. However, Maine and Nebraska each have a variation of proportional representation. After the presidential election, your governor prepares a certificate of ascertainment listing all of the candidates who ran for presidents in the state along with the names of the respective electors. The certificate of ascertainment also declares the winning presidential candidate in the state and shows which electors will represent the state at the meeting of electors, which is um, in December of the election year. Our state certificates of ascertainments are also sent to Congress and the National Archives as part of official records of the presidential election. The meeting of the electors takes place on the first Monday after the second Wednesday in December. <laughs> the meeting of the electors takes place on the first Monday after the second Wednesday in December after the presidential election. The electors meet in their respective states where they can cast their votes for president and vice president on separate ballots. Our state electors' votes are recorded on a certificate of vote, which is prepared at the meeting by the electors. Our state certificates of votes are sent to the Congress and the National Archives as part of the official records of the presidential election. Each state's electoral votes are counted in a joint session of Congress on the 6th of January in the year following the meeting of the electors. Members of the House and Senate meet in the House chamber to conduct the official tally of electoral votes. The president, as president of the Senate, presides over the count and announces the results of the vote. The president of the Senate then declares which person, if any, have been elected president and vice president of our country. The president elect takes the oath of office and is sworn in as president of the United States on January 20th in the year following the presidential election. And again, there will be links for you to go and check out so you can uh, do your research, inform yourself, and hopefully inform your family and friends, because I think it's really advantageous to the nation, to the U.S. citizens, for us to be aware and know what is actually going on. And perhaps we won't get worked up so much when we see all these theatrics from these uh, different 
nominees. Just a thought. I'm Otis Q. Pate here on the Top Cats Rebel Connection. We're rebels with a cause without a pause, providing edutainment wrapped in eclectic music. Top Cat's Rebel Connection can be found at Spreaker.com slash Top Cat's Airborne. That's Spreaker.com slash T-O-P-K-A-T-S-A-I-R-B-O-R-N. Criticisms is the next section that I want to move into regarding the Electoral College Criticisms, irrelevancy of national popular vote. The elections of 1876, 1888, and 2000 produced an electoral college winner who did not receive at least a plurality of the nationwide popular vote. In 1824, there were six states in which electors were legislated, legislatively appointed rather than popularly elected. So, the true national popular vote is uncertain. Or I should say when no candidate received a majority of electoral votes in 1824, the election was decided by the House of Representatives and so could be considered distinct from the latter three elections in which all of the states had popular selection of electors. Opponents of the Electoral College claim that such outcomes do not logically follow the normative concept of how a democratic system should function. One is that the electoral college violates the principle of political equality 
since presidential elections are not decided by one person, one vote principle. Outcomes of this sort are attributed to the federal nature of the system. Supporters of the Electoral College argue that candidates must build a popular base that is geographically broader and more diverse in voter interests. This feature is not a logical consequence of having intermediate elections of presidents, but rather the winner-takes-all method of allocating each state's slate of electors. Allocation of electors in proportion to the state's popular vote could reduce this effect. Scenarios exhibiting the outcome typically result when winning when the winning candidate has won the re- the requisite configuration of states and thus the, their votes by small margins, but the losing candidate captured larger voter margins in the remaining states. In this case, the very large margin secured by the losing candidate in the other states would aggregate to well over 50% of the ballots that cast nationally. In a two-candidate race, with equal voter turnout in every district and no faithless electors, a candidate could win the Electoral College while winning only about 22% of the nationwide popular vote. This would require the candidate in question to win each one of the following states by just one vote, like Alabama, Alaska, Arizona, Arkansas, Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware, the District of Columbia, Hawaii, Idaho, and on and on and on. There's quite a few here. As a result of the present functionality of the Electoral College is that the national popular vote bears no legal or factual significance on determining the outcome of the election. I'll read that again. A result of the present functionality of the Electoral College is that the national popular vote bears no legal or factual significance on determining the outcome of the election. Since the national popular vote is irrelevant, both voters and candidates are assumed to base their campaign strategies around the existence of the Electoral College. Any close race has candidates campaigning to maximize electoral votes by capturing coveted swing states, not to maximize national popular vote totals. I hope that is very interesting and uh, insightful to you. Especially here in 2016, we have so much ongoing, as I alluded to earlier, with the current candidates for president and the way that the mainstream media just hypes everything up. It really is like a circus to me when I watch it. As a matter of fact, I have disciplined myself not to watch most of it. Sometimes it's a bit entertaining, but if I don't have some popcorn and something that I really like to sip on the drink, I most definitely can't check it out. I have to have some type of distraction. But at the same time, it's uh, important for me just to keep up on a bit of the ongoings surrounding the election here in 2016 the new president is supposed to be selected very very soon and uh, I know many people have said on social media because I've read it quite a few times on different social media platforms that President Barack Obama might not even leave office after his eighth year after his Second term. Have you heard about that? Well, I've heard that quite a few times in the last three years, and I've read about it quite a few times in the last three years. And you say, where where have I heard about it? Well, I've heard about it from different mainstream news programs. I've heard about it from online news programs that are very, very popular stations that I'm not going to promote, by the way, but stations that have over a million followers. They've talked about this as well, that President Obama very well might not be leaving office after this term. And uh, 
there has been quite a few reasons that I have read about, probably have read about 50 or so over the past few years, but uh, there are quite a few of those comments and stuff that has been written and spoken that make a whole lot of sense, even though the actual occurrence seems very unlikely. But I guess uh, in that realm, only time will tell. And I also have to add that I have seen quite a few elections in my short time here on the planet, although I have not seen one that is, that is so dramatized and so uh, theatrical as the current one. And I also must say in conclusion, it would, to me, be very cool a nice experience, I think, for our country to have a female president, although that is certainly not me saying that I would vote for Hillary Clinton or not. That's not the particular point I'm trying to make. What I'm trying to make is that since the 1700s or Many would say 1776 if they don't know about the eight presidents before George Washington, which is on our channel. There were eight presidents before George Washington, but we will say from the mid 1700s, there have been nothing but male presidents and nothing but male vice presidents. That's it. And I don't need to go into detail, I'm sure, with you on why it is only equal or only fair or only very much something that should be considered because of women also being a part of the country and paying for taxes. And, and we can go into all the other reasons why it's certainly time, if nothing else, to have a female president. And you know, if you uh, actually think about it, regardless of how good the performance or how bad the performance of a female president would be, it most certainly couldn't be any worse than what we, in my opinion, could not be any worse than what we have experienced in the last, oh my goodness, I would say in the last 20 years. Of course, there have been some things that have been cool and, you know, there's been fruitful and positive coming from the presidents, but in general, I would say since the late 90s, after Clinton ba actually balanced the budget, President Bill Clinton balanced the budget back in the day. And I don't know if you know that, but now it is somewhere around 17 to 18 trillion dollars that our country is in the hole. So I don't know what in the world people are talking about when they talk about uh, and go on about the uh, country being the richest country in the world. That doesn't make much sense. Does not make much sense at all. Considering that huge mammoth, unbelievable debt. But nevertheless, that's uh, the information that we wanted to share with you on the uh, Top Cat's rebel connection having to do with the elections and the electoral college and who actually selects and not elects the president and vice president of our country. Yep. Tune in again very soon because we'll be looking for you to join us here on the channel. We're broadcasting live. I'm broadcasting live. And... I will, in the very near future, make it so we can also chat during the shows and maybe you can drop a little knowledge on me that I can share over the microphone. And uh, if things are cool enough and interest permits, we'll also go ahead and uh, start taking calls so we can talk to some of you in person. All those different things are in the mix and... 
I guess with that too, time will tell what uh, transpires. But until the next broadcast, take care. <laughs>